Hello. Hi. Welcome, welcome. Good to be with you. I pray that all is well with you and that you had a wonderful Monday. Welcome to another week. God bless you, bless you. Let me pray and get started. I thank you, Father. Thank you, Heavenly Father, because you are God all by yourself. All power and glory belongs to you, Lord God. So this evening as we sit and enjoy the session this evening, I pray, O oh God, that you would be glorified. All glory would go to you. You would receive ultimate glory from everything that's said and done. But I pray that as you are glorified, we would be edified and your word would be made plain. Bless us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you, bless you. Good to be with you this evening. The topic this evening is, who are the true prophets? Who are the true prophets? You know, we got a lot of prophets running around nowadays, so who are the true prophets? Who? For many years now, the search has been on throughout the Commonwealth of the Bahamas and around the world to identify the true prophets of God. Whenever a prophecy is given, the extremes run both ways. They run in both directions. Either the criticisms begin with, you know, prophet my foot. They all about lying on God. They better stop before God strike them dead. Okay, those are the ones that are the critics. And on and on it goes, the slander and the vitriol. However, there are others who have had a totally opposite feeling on the matter. They see it totally different. They hear prophet and they have a totally different opinion on the matter. And their death statements will be like, you hear what the prophets say? Lord Jesus, what we can do? Run to the store, buy the groceries, buy all the water, buy all the toilet tissue. So from one end to the next, one end say, they, they're full of foolishness. And the next end say, hurry up, you hear what the prophet, every word the prophet say they believe. So it goes both ways. We have people on both ends of the, of the spectrum. Normally, these two extremes are from critical extremists. They are totally critically extremes. The passage of scripture that, that the, the naysayers use is Deuteronomy 18.22. It says, When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet had spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. So those are the naysayers. This is their foundation scripture. If that prophecy don't come to pass, they didn't hear from God. They spoke of their own volition and shouldn't be afraid of him. So that's one extreme. And for the panic crew, the scripture passage is Second Chronicles 20.20. 20, and it says, <clears throat> And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. So here the, here the other extremes say, you're supposed to believe the prophet, otherwise you will not prosper. You will not prosper. The prophet of God, if you go against the prophet of God, you will be cursed. However, we must understand that false prophets... Where we, are, where we are as Christians, if we're thinking of people as false prophet, we should not be focusing our energy on this kind of situation in these critical times. Busy trying to examine and investigate others, the time is running out. We need to get our work done. This is not a serious concern for us. Why? Because the prophets will receive the judgment of God in due season. When they stand before God and start talking about how, oh, we did this in your name and that in your name, they will be judged at that time if they are false prophets. It's not up to us to jump all over, hopping up and down, making a bunch of noise about who is a false prophet. We put ourselves in danger when we spend most of our time judging and scrutinizing the words of the prophets. Instead of trying to figure out which prophet is using divination or evil power, and who's really, really using the power of God, we do not need to panic when we get a prophecy. There's no need to panic. If we're going to panic, we're not believing that Jesus said, he'll never leave us nor forsake us. 
If he said he'll never leave us nor forsake us, then regardless of what happens, he is with us. All we need to do is let the prophecy run its course. Why? Because usually most prophets put a time stamp on their prophecy. They'll say this year, next month, at the end, before the end of the year, within the next six months, within the next three days, all prophets put, most prophets, put a stamp on every time stamp on every prophecy that they utter, every prophetic, prophetic utterance. We can simply allow the prophecy to run its course. If it comes to pass, if it don't come to pass, it does not benefit us as individuals whether the prophecy come to pass or not. We might say if it don't come to pass, we're better off. Okay, but if it don't come to pass, what are you going to do? Shoot the prophet? Pay attention to your life, your walk with the Lord. We don't have to dive down the rabbit hole searching for clues, trying to figure out whether this happened on the time when they said it would happen or did it happen afterwards. So, and sad to say there are many who do nothing but scrutinize prophets all the time. That's all they have time to do, scrutinize prophets. What, where's the work that Jehovah sent you to do? What you doing about that? We can also glean wisdom from the word of God by studying the lives of pro the prophets of old. If we're so, you know, consumed with the thought of who's a real prophet and who's not, let's just look at the lives of some of the prophets of old. We may find out, we'll find out that some of them weren't always on point. We might think the old prophets were always right on the money every time they spoke or they were living lives that were just victorious all the time. No, some prophets had really, really depressed days, depressed days. Let us check it out. 1 Kings 19, 14, let's look at the prophet Elijah, a mighty prophet Elijah. And in verse 14 he said, uh, it goes, and he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have, forsake, have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. So here's the mighty prophet Elijah having himself a full-blown pity party, thinking that he was the only one left serving Jehovah. Was he a true prophet? Of course. Elijah was one of the most powerful prophets in the whole Bible. Of course he was a true prophet. But you don't want to go bothering with, with Elijah. Elijah was very powerful. He caused the rain to cease for three and a half years. God sent ravens to feed him, the miracle of the barrel of meal and, and, and a cruise of oil that lasted the tiny little bit of oil and the tiny bit of meal that lasted throughout the famine, that was in his day. He blessed that lady to be able to have that. He called fire down from heaven on the altar of the prophets of Baal and when he was on Mount Carmel. He called down fire from heaven. And when he was ready for the rain to come back, when it was time for the rain to come back, he called on the Lord and the rain came back. So he was able to call down drought and he was able to call down rain. He was a horror to Ahab and Jezebel. They just couldn't, they couldn't do nothing with him. He was a horror to them. And on two different occasions, he called down fire on 50 soldiers. The soldiers came to get him because the king sent him, sent them for him. He called on fire on the 50 um, soldiers. The king sent 50 more. He called on fire on them set too. So he killed a hundred soldiers with fire from heaven. This was a powerful, powerful prophet. He parted Jordan by taking off his mantle and hit the water. When he slapped the water, the water parted and he was able to walk across on dry land. Elijah the prophet. But guess what? In verse, uh, in Second Kings nineteen eighteen, in verse eighteen, and after he was done with all these prophecies, all these wonderful things, he said in verse eighteen, um, "No, Jehovah is saying to him in verse eighteen, yet I have left me seven thousand in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him." 
So, how is it that the mighty prophet, the mighty prophet of God, Elijah, did not know that he was not the only person serving Jehovah? How did he not know that there were 7,000 that did not bow the kneels to Baal, that was still there serving the Lord? How did he not know that? As the prophet of God, as the one that God talks to every day, how did he not know? How did he not know? Because the prophet, just like every other child of God, is human. Sometimes because they are prophet, we elevate them to almost God-like status. The prophet. And that's what gets us in trouble. We wind up wasting our time, and then we wind up causing problems for them because their egos sometimes can't take it. You elevate them to this high, high place where everybody just wants to bow down almost at their feet. And they are human. They are fallible. And even though the statement prophecy and prophet gets kind of spooky and super, super spiritual, we must not let that cause us to put them in God's status, in worship, in, in, in positions where we need to worship and really, you know, bow down to them. We cannot allow ourselves to get caught up in that. They have flaws, just like everyone else. They have flaws. And as we look around, we, we get the, the understanding that, you know, prophets are, they're amazing people. Yes, they are. But we cannot allow them to get to the point where and we cause problems for them. We cause them to step out of their calling into an era where, area where, you know, they're not where they're supposed to be. They are humans, just like everybody else. Let's look at another prophet. Consider another prophet. There's a prophet Balaam. Some commentaries call him a non-Israelite sorcerer. They don't even call him a prophet. They call him a non-Israelite sorcerer. And many call him a pagan prophet. They don't think he's a real prophet. He's a pagan. He is not a child of, he's not a, a Israelite. He is a, he's not an Israelite. He may be a prophet, but he's not an Israelite. And some call him a sorcerer. However, Balaam, would probably fit in quite nicely in our society today because he had a reputation that if anyone he blessed was blessed and anyone he cursed was cursed. Balaam was powerful. He was batting a thousand. He had all his ducks in a row and he was working that. Although they called him a sorcerer because he was not an Israelite. But what do we see Balaam doing when Balak, the king of the Moabites, contracted him to curse the children of Israel. What did he do? In Numbers 22, 5 to 6, it says, He sent messengers before unto Balaam. This is Balak, the king of Moab, sending. He sent therefore messengers unto Balaam, the son of Beor of Pithor, and which is by the river in the land of the children of the people, of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, there is a people come out of Israel. Behold, they cover the face of the earth, and they abide over against me. Come now, therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people, for they are too mighty for me. Preadventure I shall prevail, that we may smite them, that I may drive them out of the land, for I wot that whom thou blessed, blesses is blessed, and whom thou curses is cursed. So he's telling Balaam, your reputation precedes you. I have heard that whoever you bless is blessed and whoever you curse is cursed. So come over here, come curse these people for me so we could be able to destroy them and drive them out of the land. Why? That's what he wants Balaam to do for him. And he's ready to pay good money to get, and this is one of the things with prophets. People will pay them to get a good prophecy or a bad prophecy or to get them to say something negative to somebody else. So this is why we cannot be um, making prophets feel like, you know, oh, they're more than what they are. They are just like us. It's just that they have a particular gift. And any true prophet will tell you, I, I, I have depressed days too. I have bad days too. Don't make it seem like because I'm a prophet, I am 
higher than any other. I'm a human being just like you, and they will tell you that. In verse 7, it says, that's Numbers 22, 7, it says, And the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the rewards for divination in their hands. So now they bring in money for Balaam and rewards for Balaam. And they came unto Balaam and spake unto him the words of Bela, the king. And he said unto them, Lodge here this night, and I will bring you word again, as the Lord shall speak unto me. And the princes of Moab abode with Balaam. Verse 9, And God came unto Balaam and said, What men are these with thee? And Balaam said unto God, Belak, the king, the son of Zippor, the king of Moab, had sent unto, sent unto me, saying, Behold, there is a people come out of Egypt, which covers the face of the earth. Come now, curse me them. Pre-adventure, I shall be able to overcome them and drive them out. And the Lord said unto Balaam, Thou shalt not go with them. Thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. It's amazing. They called Balaam a sorcerer, a pagan prophet. But he did nothing until he went and sought the Lord. That's why we cannot be trying to, you know, investigate people and trying to cast spurgeon, dispersion on people because we see the outward appearance. We don't know what they do in their private time. And here's Bala, Balaam in his private time seeking the Lord for an answer. Seeking the Lord for an answer. Call him pagan all you want. Call him sorcerer all you want. He went to Jehovah and asked Jehovah, what is he supposed to do? I mean, sometimes you could read about people in the Bible, people that are really full of integrity in the Bible, but sometimes they don't. David, at one point, did not go and ask the Lord. He just went ahead and did what he wanted to do, and he failed miserably. But here's Balaam, the pagan prophet. He now goes and seeks the Lord before he takes this contract. This contract has money involved. This man came and bring him money to make sure that he go ahead and do this wicked thing and curse the people of Israel. This is an example of how persons that are not spiritual in our opinion can have a real connection with Jehovah. We may think the prophet is good for nothing, but he may have a real connection with Jehovah. Here is one called a sorcerer, a, div a diviner, Yet he is inquiring of Jehovah God before making a decision. A decision that includes money, riches, wealth. But still, he said, I can't take your wealth until I talk to Jehovah and find out what to do. And then what does he do? He carries out Jehovah's instructions. That's why we should always remember that only Jehovah knows the heart of a man. We need to stop trying to judge people by outward appearance. Only Jehovah knows the heart of a man. And you may say, oh, I see him drunk, or oh, I see him this, or oh, I see him that. Only Jehovah knows the heart of a man. The people we think are not spirituals, we need to be careful with that. The days are quickly fleeting, and we cannot waste our precious time on issues that do not determine our eternal destiny. Whether or not we call out a prophet or know whether a prophet is real or not real, that is not going to secure us eternally. That is not going to gain us brownie points in heaven or brownie points so that we are now more super spiritual, we are now more spiritual, we can detect prophets. It's not going to benefit us in the long run. Let us continue to work for the kingdom of God and allow him to determine who is right and who is wrong. Why? Because only he knows. He alone knows the heart of a man. Only Jehovah knows the heart of a man. After Balaam had gone and all this drama had taken place, because there was a whole lot of drama in this one little, um, Numbers 24, there was a whole lot of drama going on in there. Because it is all about, and further down in the story, you talk about how the donkey spoke to Balaam. Because he now go in, he insists on going where he want to go. And now the, the donkey is trying to stop him from going. Because the angel is standing there with the sword, getting ready to swipe his head off. 
and the donkey wouldn't move and he beat the donkey and the donkey crushed his foot against the wall and all this goes on in Numbers 24. All this activity is in Numbers 24 when the donkey spoke to Balaam. In the final decision, it was still directed by Jehovah. Numbers 24, 11 to 13 says, this is the king speaking to Balaam, he said, Therefore now flee thou to thy place. I thought to promote thee unto great honor, but lo, the Lord had kept thee from honor. What is he saying? He's telling him, I was planning to promote you and give you plenty money, but the Lord caused you to not curse the people, so now the Lord caused you and get no honor and riches. Um, verse 12, And Balaam said unto Balak, Spake I not also unto thy messengers, which thou sendest unto me, saying, If Balak would give me his house, full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the commandment of the Lord, to do either good or, or, or bad of mine own mind. But what the Lord saith, that will I speak. Regardless of whatever everyone thought about Balaam, he had reverential fear for Jehovah God. He had reverential fear for God and he obeyed God's instructions. Which is more than you could say for a lot of people in the Bible that are listed there. Not very many of them could always say, we follow the laws of Jehovah. Not all of them can say that. But Balaam, especially in this instance, he sought the Lord and he did what the Lord told him to do. The Lord said, don't curse them people, leave them alone. So, he tell Balak, you could follow me your house full of money. I cannot go beyond what the Lord told me. All around the world, people are dying in record numbers. And I'm sure some of them, they're saints and they passed on. And if they could get some extra time to do some more work for the kingdom of God, they would take it. And sometimes we would even regret the fact that, look, some people lying on a deathbed and now thinking back and saying, Lord, look at the time I spent gossiping. Look at the time I spent worrying about this one and that one. Look at the amount of time I spent searching up and digging up and trying to find dirt on people just to make sure they don't look as good as me in the kingdom of God. Waste of time. Waste of your time. Stay focused on the Lord. Stay focused on the Lord. I'm sure that when they got over in the, in the glory land, they'd be like, I could have done more. I could have done more. But I wasted my time on things that really does not matter to me personally in eternity. They will wish they had made better use of their time. We who are still here need to remember that Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Let us get our own assignments completed. The, 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 the prophets are getting their assignments completed. You busy flapping up your mouth about them? They're getting their assignments completed. Whether they're right, whether they're wrong, they are prophets and they are prophesying. The prophets are working hard. What are the rest of us doing? What are we doing? Inspection? We inspect and stuff? No, no, no. We must work on our own individual God-given purposes. Let us work on the purpose that God gave us. The reason why he sent us here. We must get our work done. Matthew 7, 15 says, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Yet uh, ye know, ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? It's saying you will know the false prophet and the right prophet by their fruits. But Jehovah didn't call us to be fruit inspectors. You see the fruit? That's who they are? Okay, them being awful is not going to make me any more good. You know how they say? You know, um, them, sh me shining my light, them shining their dimming their light is not going to make my light shine any brighter. You're just trying to tear up people so that you can look better. No, that is ungodly. We cannot be doing that. We cannot do that. So if the prophets will be, if the prophets will be able to deceive, 
the ravening wolves, if they will be able to deceive us as sheep, as, as, as wolves in sheep clothing, the most important we can do is read, the most important thing we can do is read and study the Word of God consistently. Learn how to pray. Learn how to pray and get busy praying because so many talk about prayer. We do a lot of talking about prayer. And who need prayer? And the nation need prayer. And the world need prayer. But nobody gets around to actually doing the praying. We need to get around to actually doing that praying. Doing that job. Taking control of that task and getting it done. Let us spend less time judging and scrutinizing the lives of others. And more time on our own business. On our own projects. On our own purpose. And God knows we have many flaws. We have flaws. We have issues. Why are we busy trying to, let's say, trying to take the speck out your brother's eyes while the moat is in your eye, the plank is in your own eye? We need to get busy doing our own projects, our own purpose, fulfilling our own purpose, because time is running out. We need to make sure we are ready. Revelation 19.20 says, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped the image. They both were cast into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. What does this say? There's a lot that's going to go on. In the final hours before the return of Christ, the book of Revelation is telling us that deception will be really, really high. Will be really, really high. Deception will be high. And the false prophet will be performing miracles. Be performing miracles. We cannot afford to let the miracles distract us. Why? Because the miracles of the purpose of the miracles is to get you distracted. The purpose of the false prophecy or the prophecies or the, 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 the talk of gloom and doom and scare is caused to paralyze you, to cause you to do nothing. Instead of continuing to work in the kingdom of God, you decide to do nothing. You get paralyzed and scared, lock up in your house, scared out of your wits. We have to focus on the word of God and continue to pray. Keep our eyes on Jesus. We must keep our eyes on Jesus. If we're wise, we'll keep our eyes on Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 25, 17 says, Pray without ceasing. This must become our life scripture. Pray without ceasing. Only prayer is going to get us through the next couple years, months, whatever, however long our lives are. Only prayer is going to get us through. We have to continue to focus and pray. When the prophet gives a dreadful word or a dreadful prophecy, what we do, we pray and ask Jehovah for his direction and his protection. Get quiet, get alone, get alone with God and ask him, Lord, what am I supposed to do with this information? You hear what they tell me is going to happen? What am I supposed to do with this information? We seek his face and ask him for his direction and his protection. And when we get a glorious word or the word about, oh, the Lord's going to bless you with a house and a car and whatever have you, what we do, we pray and give thanks to the Lord. And what we do, we give the prophecy time to be fulfilled. We listen to the timeline that the prophet gives and we allow the prophecy to continue to work towards fulfillment. We never, ever, ever allow fear to paralyze us. Sometimes, the, especially if this is a false prophet, when they give those prophecies, those prophecies for, to, to paralyze you. That's why when you hear the bad prophecies, go to God in prayer. Allow Jehovah to speak peace to your soul and just live life one day at a time. And allow Jehovah to work the whole thing out. Give the prophecy time to fulfill, time to come to pass. Why? Because sometimes we spend so much time living in the future, we cannot enjoy the present. So if the prophecy, if the prophet comes and say, oh, in six months this is going to happen, coming towards the end of the year, this is, is going to happen. Is it end of the year yet? 
If it's six months yet, no. So enjoy today. Jehovah woke you up in your right mind, gave you food to eat, clothes to wear, shelter. Thank him for that and continue to walk towards and walk out your purpose. Walk out your purpose. It's going to take so much focus and dedication to the word of God and to the voice of Jehovah to keep us in these last days. It is going to take focus. It is going to take dedication and commitment to the things of God, to the word of God, to the purpose of God. It is going to take commitment and focus. We dare not let the enemy trap us in the weed, get us caught up in a ball of, ball of thread, tangle up, trying to inspect every prophecy we hear. You don't have time for that. If it's a destruction coming, go to Jehovah and pray. Jehovah, protect us. Whether it's a false prophecy or a right prophecy, just go and ask Jehovah to protect us. Because we don't know the heart of man. We don't know whether the prophet is a real prophet or not. We don't know if this time the prophet could be on or off or whatever. We just do not know. Just let the prophecy take its course. Run its course. Let it run its course. But enjoy your life every day. We say, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Enjoy each day. And they're all investigating to see whether the prophet is right or wrong stop it that is not going to help our individual walk with the Lord whether the prophet right or wrong it's not going to help my individual walk with the Lord I still have to get up every morning and pray and seek the Lord and call upon him and ask him to protect me and keep me and guide me and direct my path I still have to do that every day so whether the prophet right or wrong just continue to live from day to day. What the song say? I don't know about tomorrow. I just live from day to day. I don't borrow from his sunshine. You can't borrow from tomorrow. Leave tomorrow where it is and enjoy every day that Jehovah allows you to see. And enjoy everyone. There's this old song that used to say, sweep around your own front door. Sweep around your own front door. Don't worry about people. Don't worry about prophecy and all that. Pray. We have to pray anyway, whether you hear a word from a prophet or not. Prayer is what Jehovah requires. Men are always to pray and not to faint. Pray. Pray without ceasing. We have to pray anyway, so just continue to pray and allow Jehovah to fulfill everything that according to his word. As the old saying goes, sweep around your own front door. Stop worrying tomorrow problems. Stop dipping into people's business. Sweep around your own front door. It'd be amazing when we get to heaven and we realize, Oh my Lord, the prophet did all their work. Look at the reward they're getting. Oh my goodness, Jehovah just lavishing um, reward upon them. What happened to my rewards? You were busy watching the prophet. You were busy watching the prophet and calling him a false prophet. And making fun and, 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 and maligning and you and vitriol all over everybody so the prophet now has his reward and then he's rewarded for remember the, the beatitude it says blessed are you and men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven or so persecuted they the prophets which were before you so their reward is going to be great the more you persecute them the more you talk for them the more you malign and tear them down Jesus said their reward in heaven will be great why because they were accused falsely they were falsely accused of being false prophets only Jehovah knows the heart of any man woman boy girl only Jehovah knows the heart so let Jehovah do what he needs to do with them. So how do we as Christians spot the false prophets? We don't. We don't go around trying to spot the false prophet or find out who is the real prophet, who is the true prophet. That is not our job. Jehovah called us to reach the lost. Are we doing that? Are we witnessing? Are we bringing souls to the kingdom? 
or are we doing inspection? Let us continue to continue to seek Jehovah, continue to press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling and leave all that inspection to Jehovah. We listen to the prophecies, we be still and let and seek the Lord and let him speak to our heart, speak peace to our spirit, regardless of what the prophecy says. It may be very terrible, it may be very hard to accept, hard to receive. Pray and ask Jehovah to speak peace to your heart. Because what he does not want you to do is get paralyzed by fear. And the enemy wants us, even if it's a real prophecy, even if it's a true prophecy, we cannot become paralyzed by fear. We cannot allow a fear to cause us to stop in our tracks and do nothing. No. We need to let whatever is said, good, bad, or ugly, let us continue to press, cause us to press toward the mark. Cause us to continue to sink deeper into Jehovah. Cause us to stay in the word even more. Cause us to pray, 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 pray. Yes. If the evil prophecy or the bad prophecy does anything good for us, it'll cause us to pray, 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 pray. And stay in the word. That's a good thing that the evil prophecy will do for us. Because you know, some many times in the Bible, when they prayed, Jehovah heard and he changed his mind. King Hezekiah was bound to die and he prayed and Jehovah heard him and changed his mind and gave him 15 years longer added to his life. How many things in the Bible Jehovah prayed and Jehovah answered and changed what he had initially intended to do. So let us continue to just continue to serve Jehovah in spirit and in truth and in the beauty of holiness. James 4 7 says James chapter 4 verse 7 says submit yourselves therefore unto God resist the devil and he will flee from you what is the first step submit to Jehovah submit under pay attention allow him to rule and reign submit ourselves to Jehovah and he will give us the strength to resist the devil and he will flee from us so let us continue to remember we don't want to get, to get there standing before the throne and realize we wasted our time. Wasted your time. Wasted your time. Getting in other people's business. Get busy doing what Jehovah sent you here to do. The purpose for which he sent you to this planet, get busy doing that. And once you're done doing that, we call you home, you'll be able to stand and he'll be able to say to you, Well done, our good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. You get to share his kingdom. So we don't have time for investigations. We are busy trying to press our way through that we will have a glorious, glorious entrance into the kingdom of Jehovah. God bless you, bless you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much for joining me. Let me pray and close. Heavenly Father, I thank you. Thank you for your promise. Thank you for the prophets. Lord, we pray that you would bless them and allow them to hear directly from you so they can give us the warnings and anything that you want to say to us. But Father, help us not to become paralyzed by fear. Help us not to allow fear to paralyze us. Let, let, let the, the word of the prophet drive us closer to you, deeper in prayer, deeper in your word, more committed in our service, because we know the time is short. We continue to press toward the mark. Lord, help us to continue to walk with you and to talk with you not looking to the left or the right, but being focused on Jesus Christ. That at his appearing, he will say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Lord, bless us as we go to bed tonight. We pray that you grant us sweet sleep, that we will rise in the morning to continue our walk in the center of your will. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you, bless you. Thank you so much for joining me. It was a pleasure to be with you. Um, I'll be back on Friday at 8 p.m. Like I say, like I always say, you could have been doing anything else, but you decided to spend these moments with me. Thank you ever so much, and may Jehovah continually bless your life. Bye-bye.